My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the founder of the Parent Education Series and co-founder of nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are so glad to have you all with us tonight, and we are especially glad to have with us Dr. Iran McGinn, who is tonight's featured keynote presenter. If you're here for how to have a better relationship with your child or teen, you are in the right place and you're in for a treat tonight. With over 350 people registered for this program, we know this is an important and timely topic. If you would like Spanish interpretation tonight, we have with us Trini Lara, who will be doing simultaneous Spanish live. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a globe icon. Please click on that globe icon and then click on Spanish to hear Espanol. So we hope you do. If you have questions, feel free to type them in in Spanish if you have them in the Q&A. All right, first of all, I wanna start out by saying a really big thank you to Andrea Guerin, the Director of Health and Wellness for the Redwood City School District, who has helped us put this program together this year, and also to the Redwood City School District who sponsored this series. We are so grateful to you. Without you, we would not be here. Our other sponsors, as always, include the Sequoia Healthcare District and the Peninsula Healthcare District, as well as nonprofit, The Parent Venture. So tonight's format, just briefly, is Iran is going to be speaking to you for about, what do you say, Iran? 30 minutes, 40 minutes? Oh, hopefully a lot less than that, 20 to 30. Okay, all right, but take your time. And then we are going to open it up to you, the audience, for questions. So tonight, feel free to use the chat box to talk to each other, to talk to us, to share comments. My partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting relevant links into the chat. So do look at that. And then we ask that you put questions in the Q&A button. We want to get to as many of your questions as we can tonight, because we know that this topic, parent-child communication and how to have a better relationship with your child or teen is really important, especially now as schools are starting to reopen and kids are heading back to school. So again, content, chat for comments, questions in the Q&A. Um, tonight's event will be recorded and available on our free video library. We like to thank again the media production team from the Boys and Girls Club in Redwood City. Next events coming up actually tomorrow, we have two of them at 12 noon California Pacific Daylight Time. We have Dr. Tawheed Zaman in Cannabis and the Young Brain. That will be a great presentation. Bring your questions. And then at 5.30 tomorrow evening, sponsored by the Sequoia Healthcare District, we are offering Mental Health 101, When Should Parents Seek Help? Featuring Dr. Shashank Joshi from Stanford. He is the Director of School of Mental Health again at the university. So two events tomorrow, we hope that you will join us. And now let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenter. Dr. Iran McGinn earned his MA in education and PhD in psychology from Stanford University. And he completed his postdoctoral training in population health at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. McGann served as the research director for the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Counseling and Psychological Services before founding the Center for Supportive Relationships and his new organization, Parenting for Humans. Dr. McGann works with public school districts, universities, hospitals, and private corporations where he teaches educators, parents, clinicians, and managers how to build stronger, more joyful relationships in their professional and personal lives. Dr. McGinn's work has been published in top tier scientific journals, including Psychological Science, Emotion, and Academic Pediatrics. And he's been cited in popular media outlets varying from Allure Magazine to Psychology Today. Please join me in a really warm welcome for Dr. Iran McGinn. Take it away, Iran. Great. Thank you, Charlene. <clears throat> I, the more we do this, the more I feel like I should now be able to do a similar introduction for you uh, since you're also a big deal in parents' lives. There's a dog in the background who might get excited, but if you can't hear me over the dog, just let me know. Um, and at least it should not slow down our interpreter because you probably don't really translate Wolf into anything. Okay, so. Um, let me share my screen because that's how we know we're in Zoom. And I'll get going. So my plan is to talk for maybe 20 minutes um, and, and kind of seed a conversation, I hope, um, based on your questions afterwards. I think the most interesting 
part of, of this entire event, these conversations that happen. Also, the darkness around me is not a reflection of my mood. I'm just, I'm on the East Coast. Uh, I'm in a different time zone. Uh, and so here I am, and there you are. So if you have questions while I talk, please put them into the, I guess we can do that. You can do either the chat or Q&A feature. I won't see them as I go, um, but I'll stop at the end and then um, we'll start pulling questions out to, um, to discuss. Okay, so the topic for today is, is kind of a broad introduction, I guess, to, to the, the topic of parenting. Um, I don't mean introduction in the sense that you have no preliminary, uh, uh, you know, no previous idea of how to do this. Obviously, you've been doing this and you know how to do it, but kind of this prime, primer to, to this approach of relationships first uh, and how to have a better relationship with your child. So I will start. Um, just in the big picture, uh, I, the way that I orient to interactions that happen between people in general, certainly parents and kids, is I ask how much emotional intensity is uh, present at any given time, strong emotions like fear or anger or even pride or joy or things like that. And in the big picture, I put them into three buckets. One is green when nobody's especially upset, kind of normal times, and that's when you focus on relationship building. Uh, and then yellow when people have stronger emotions, sometimes very strong emotions, and you need to provide support to them, and that's the main orientation. And then there's the red zone that we won't really talk about today unless you ask about it uh, during Q&A. And that's when people have such a strong, intense reaction or emotion going on that, that they're in danger um, to themselves or to someone else. And the rules change when this happens. Um, we focus on safety at the expense of the relationship, right? whereas in the other two zones, uh, the relationship is the primary thing that we orient to. Today, we're gonna to talk about relationship building when people, when everybody's pretty calm, you are calm, your child is pretty calm, things are kind of going along fine. We'll also talk some about what to do when they are upset um, and how to turn that into part of what can make your relationship closer, the way that you support your child when your child is upset. Here's the takeaway uh, for those of you that have either limited time or limited attention span uh, or kids that are running around doing things. Uh, th this is really the bottom line of the whole thing. Um, we think about parenting a lot as coaching or educating or teaching and things like that. And I think to the extent that you can set aside time to enjoy your child, just that, just you enjoy your child and your child will get it. Uh, it's amazing to be enjoyed, right? And so, some people do this kind of naturally. Some people are very focused on coaching and teaching, uh, of course, because you want the best for your child and you want your child to, to learn um, as much as possible. Um, if you find yourself in the latter group, I would say at least set aside some time when you switch off your coaching mode or take off your coaching hat or whatever is your favorite analogy. Just spend time enjoying your child. And more broadly, this idea of relationship first. Uh, Ask yourself, whenever you're starting to push something, to do something that starts creating conflict, ask yourself, is it worth it? Does it matter that much? Um, am I, is this worth sacrificing relationship points? Because that's what you're paying with when you're pushing your kid to do something that your kid doesn't want to do. So the rest of the time that I talk today, the next, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, will be essentially an expansion of this, uh, how to enjoy your child and how to prioritize relationships. Okay, another big thing to keep in mind is that all the things that we'll talk about, that I'll talk about today and then we'll discuss together, none of it is a trick. All of it are things that you can talk about with your kid. You can say, you know, I met today with, you know, I, I went to a class or I met with friends and we talked about this. Um, I, I want to spend more time just enjoying your company. Uh, I want to get to know you better. Um, none of it needs to be a kind of a secret, you know, hidden technique. Um, but also, more importantly, internally for yourself to, to remember that you're not trying to trick your child into having a better relationship with you, and you're not trying to trick your child into talking more with you and relating more. Um, the idea is to really adopt the kind of, to cultivate in yourself the kind of mindset that gets you curious about your child, that gets you enjoying your child more of the time, learning from your child. Uh, so that's the, the humble piece there, right? Because your child has a lot to teach you about what it's like to be your child because uh, because your child knows better than you because they spend all their time in their heads and you see them sometimes from the outside. So really 
it's, it's a lot about cultivating this mindset, right? Of wanting to get to know, wanting to enjoy, wanting to learn from your child. Um, the framework that I use uh, is this idea of the relational bank account. Um, the idea is that you have a relational bank account with your child uh, and your child has one with you too, by the way. Um, and the, the currency in that is goodwill. And the more goodwill there is in a relationship, the more two people trust each other, the more they're honest with one another, the more they'll be vulnerable because they trust each other, the more effort they'll put into helping one another or, or um, complying with requests and cooperating, uh, the more they'll forgive each other if there are mistakes, right? So a lot of good things flow out of having more goodwill in a relationship. And when I say relationship first, really I mean, how do we always orient toward maximizing this, this account balance? Um, of goodwill. And so if we think about it like, like a bank account, then you can deposit and you can withdraw. And to deposit into a relational bank account, you do things that show that you care about your child or respect your child. I realize that, uh, you know, most everything you do is in order to take care of your child, right? Your kids may not always realize this. Um, the idea is not necessarily to sit them down and explain how everything you do is for them. That's nobody's favorite lecture. Um, but to orient toward things that make your child feel like you especially care about your child or especially respect your child, right? So it's all a question of how what you do is perceived. And if you're trying to create more goodwill uh, in the relationship, then it's about doing things that you know your child will appreciate that you do. Um, so this is for care and respect, um, for deposits. Withdrawals are basically the opposite, right? If you show your child that you don't really care about what your child wants or needs or enjoys, or that you don't really respect your child's ability to make decisions or opinions and so on, that's a withdrawal, um, and usually an unnecessary withdrawal. And a separate type of, with, of withdrawal is when you ask your child to do something that your child wouldn't normally do and anything, right? From pass the salt to, you know, submit your homework uh, to clean the house and so on. And those are totally fair. They're fine things to do. It's part of every relationship. We ask one another, <clears throat> excuse me, to do things that we wouldn't normally do if the other person didn't exist. It's okay to do it. Um, but it's good to be mindful of how much of a withdrawal you're making. And does it need are there ways to either make the withdrawals less frequent or not as large, right? Because you can ask for the same thing to be done in very different ways. You can ask a child to, to clean his room in a way that shows very little respect, or you can ask the child to clean room in a way that shows a lot of respect. Uh, and those are things to be mindful of because they'll, uh, they'll matter in terms of the amount of goodwill that you're sucking out of the relationship as you're doing it, right? So if you can keep this kind of framework in mind, uh, this is what I mean when I say relationship first. Uh, you, you end up constantly making these deposits and making fewer withdrawals. You end up with large reserves of goodwill that translate into all these good things uh, that are written at the bottom. So that's the kind of general framework, general approach. Here are examples of things that you can do to make deposits just throughout the day, right? Uh, without making too much of an effort. And it's really kind of about developing the, the, the habit of using these opportunities, right? These micro opportunities to make deposits uh, or rather opportunities to make these micro deposits into the relationship. And ideally you just orient toward making small, easy, constant deposits, right? You just drip into that bucket all the time until it fills up rather than trying to make these grand gestures every once in a while, right? So again, back to the original point, stop, enjoy your child, do nothing but enjoy your child, show your child that uh, you care about your child and respect your child. These are the important moments, but also throughout the day, remember to say thank you. Remember to give good praise. Um, remember to check in and just ask how your child is doing and really listen without trying to especially fix or change anything unless your child is asking for it. Um, we can come back to, to any of those, but I just want to give you an example of how, examples of how frequently this can be done throughout the day, really quite easily. Okay. General tips, um, especially regarding conversations to have with your child. So remember to, to, again, be curious about your child, want to know, 
what they care about because these are the things that'll help you do things that they'll feel like you care about them too, right? Asking open-ended questions about things and people that they care about. Um, once they get talking, especially if it's about something that's upsetting for them, don't jump in and try to fix it uh, unless they ask you to. Uh, rather, when they start talking, this is like a whole nother uh, workshop that, that I do sometimes um, about emotional support, right? That's more the yellow zone. If they start talking and they're upset, all you do is paraphrase. WIG, WIG is an acronym for what I got. So they talk and you paraphrase and you don't change what they're doing uh, and you don't change what they're feeling. All you're doing is saying, I want to understand your experience. I care about your experience. I believe you that this is your experience and I'm not trying to change it. I'm not telling you that you're wrong, that you need to think about this differently, that you need to feel about this differently. And as you go through this, um, they talk, you paraphrase, they get that you're listening and you care, they get less upset over time. This happens a few times and eventually they're a lot less upset. And at that point, you can start having a real conversation. You can give advice or ask questions, but the mistake most of us make often is just jump in with advice far, far too soon. And then it becomes kind of our solution fighting their upset. That's, that's not a helpful dynamic, right? So once they get going, spend some time paraphrasing rather than trying to change or solve what they're saying. Uh, ask for your child's opinions and advice often. Like, let your child make as many decisions as possible. I think that's a very, very important thing in terms of relationship building, right? Because the more power you give your child, the less power your child has to fight you for, right? And what defines the life of a child is basically not having power. And therefore what defines the behavior of many kids is the attempt to, to uh, take power to themselves, right? It's always the struggle, uh, especially, especially so in the teens, obviously. Um, and this also means that the more power you give, the less they have to, to fight you for having power, right? They already feel pretty good about it. Um, and so ask for opinions, ask for advice, even from your child. Uh, and put it into place. Certainly ask for their preferences regarding different activities. And as much as is reasonable, go with it, right? But that's something that I think is worth paying a lot of attention to. Um, be curious in general about them, right? Spend more time enjoying them, learning from them rather than trying to teach them and coach them. There is a time to teach them and coach them. Obviously that's important, um, but also make sure to leave time to just be curious about them and learn from them. And lastly, this is related to the um, respecting a show of respect or a show of lack of respect is when your child sets up a boundary. It's very easy and it's very tempting to ignore boundaries from children. Um, but I think it's very important to respect the boundaries. Again, as much as is reasonable. Today, I have a three and a half year old son who's hopefully sleeping now. Um, and uh, we sat down to have dinner today and usually before dinner, we say bon appetit, and then I give him a, he says bon appetit, dad, and I say bon appetit, Leon, and then uh, I give him a kiss on the forehead, and then we start, and today he said bon appetit, dad, no kiss, like this, right, and it's it's super cute, and it's very tempting to just like lean in, give him a kiss anyway, but he, he set a boundary, you know, he wasn't upset, and it wasn't a game, uh, he just said it, and so I accept it, and similarly, when there's a much larger child who says, I don't want to talk about it right now, you don't talk about it right now, right? Maybe you say, I get it, you don't wanna talk about it. When you do, or if you do, I would love to, I'm gonna be right there, you know, in the living room, um, but I get that you don't wanna talk about it right now. All this, again, is assuming that this is not some sort of a crisis situation where they're in danger or in danger of doing some horrible mistake, right? But as much as possible, respect their boundaries. And again, they will respect yours. Uh, and accept the times when you cannot respect their boundaries because they know that your default is to respect their boundaries. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these one by one fairly quickly because um, I, I don't wanna bore you and I think you probably get this, but here are examples of ways that you can check how plugged in you are into your child's life, right? Can you complete these things? What are the friend's names? How does your child like to feel? Strong, smart, capable? pretty, athletic, uh, I don't know, fill, fill, in, fill in the words, but, but what does your child especially like to feel like? Like what's a compliment that connects for your child? What does your child like doing or learning about? Um, 
what's the next thing that's coming that your child is really looking forward to, right? These are all questions you can ask yourself. I mean, you can ask this about any, any person in your life, right? Uh, but certainly your child. Um, and if you don't know, then you can ask. And your child will love to tell you. Open-ended questions uh, in terms of just conversation starters, but also conversation continuers. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, it's either one or the other, it's either closed or open. I think about it more like a spectrum um, where open-ended questions are kind of on the extreme side of the open, they're conversations that are, they're questions that are answered with long involved answers. Whereas on the extreme side of closed, they're usually answered with one word, like no or yesterday. Um, so you can say, how, how was your test? And I'll say, fine. Uh, that, that could end up, that could turn out to be a closed-ended question, right? Um, and so learning to ask questions in a way that helps your child give you longer answers that you can listen to and paraphrase uh, and see if they want to talk more about is, is a very important art that I encourage you to practice. And you can create kind of low-pressure questions by avoiding questions about the most or the least or the worst, you know, things like that. Like, you can just say, you know, what are some sports you enjoy as opposed to what's your favorite sport, uh, unless your child has a clear answer. Um, but questions that start with what was or how did or what did it feel like when usually will give you longer answers, usually, not all. Um, so instead of how was school, you might say, what did you learn about today? Specifically at social sciences, instead of asking, did you see your friend today? You could say, how did it go today with your friend in volleyball? All these things suggest already that you know something about your child, right? And you're kind of following up on something that you know your child cares about, is worried about, is happy about, things like that, right? Okay, um, in terms of paraphrasing when your child is talking, this is, it's, it's very simple and we tend to ignore it because it's so simple. It's also hard to implement because we so want to give advice and opinions and things like that. I, I'm not going to, spend time on this now just because it's, it's actually a, a, a deep uh, and very important topic and, and there's no way to do it justice in you know a few seconds. Um, but the main point is again just resist the urge to to start leading the conversation to become the focus to to tell your child what to do or how to feel uh, and instead let them talk for as long as they'll talk. That's when you build connection. Think about people that you're close to in your life. These are probably not people who are talking at you all the time. These are probably people who are listening to you a lot, right? And if you can be that person for your child, that sets you up for a very good, close, long-lasting relationship. Opinions and advice uh, from your children. Again, it's just uh, linking right back to this idea of it's a, it's a great show of respect when you ask somebody for their advice or for their opinion about something if you actually pay attention. Uh, similarly, when you respect their preferences. Uh, so it's a big show of respect, which means it's a relational deposit, just more goodwill comes out of it. And I talked about being curious uh, rather than preachy, so I'm not going to repeat that. And the don't nag, again, related to this idea of when your child sets up a boundary, respect it as much as you can. It's, it's so important. Uh, it's, it's a very easy, quick, slippery path to becoming an annoying, nagging parent. Uh, when you feel like it's okay for you to to ignore boundaries that your child set up any age, really. I mean, from six months to uh, 60 years old, uh, we can always try to ignore people's boundaries, but we can also always see when they set them up and, and respect them. Age appropriate kind of level, like uh, 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 level of what's at stake, uh, notwithstanding. All right, so these are all the tips. Uh, this is back to the big picture, right? Just taking time to enjoy your child, essentially, and showing them that you enjoy them and thinking relationship first. How do I increase goodwill? Because you're, you're in a very long-term repeated game here. Uh, it matters less if they do something perfectly today and more if your relationship got a little bit stronger, a little bit worse today. Um, relationships build slowly, uh, break down pretty quickly. Uh, and so uh, this is why I, I just repeat this all the time. Relationship first. Always ask yourself, is this worth sacrificing relationship points for? Sometimes the answer is yes, uh, but you want to at least be asking yourself that question. All right, uh, I'm wrapping up here. Um, oh, yes, the class. So 
this kind of materials in general, you can go to parentingforhumans.com. There are some recordings there of sessions like this, uh, many of them uh, recorded by Charlene. Uh, thank you again, Charlene. Um, and uh, pardon me one second. All right, pardon me. So you can go to parentingforhumans.com uh, and see a lot of materials that are there. Um, but I also wanted to uh, specifically tell you about this class. The first thing you need to know about the class is that it doesn't cost money if you can't pay for it. Um, you, you decide. There's a button that says I can pay less or I can't pay, and that's the entire scholarship application process. So it's very important to me that these materials be accessible to people regardless of financial ability. Um, having said that, I, I would love for you to take the class if you think that that's something that would be useful for you. It's a small class, small group class, uh, less than 10 people, nine people maximum, um, seven weeks. And we meet and discuss these kinds of things like we did here, but we do a lot of practice, uh, really skill building. Um, and so that's accessible also through the through the website. Uh, and the URL is here if you're interested, parentingforhumans.com. Uh, and then from there, you can find it. Okay, that that is it. So I'm gonna stop the share. And I'm ready to ready to talk. Well, thank you, Iran. That was a lot. And you know, the other great thing is I know you will like this. We have wonderful questions coming in. So today is really a workshop. All of you out there asking great questions, keep them coming. Um, I'm going to start, Iran, with a, a quick kind of urgent one. Do you have some resources you recommend for a child who is in the red zone? Um, well. I guess there's a question of how, how red of a red zone you mean. But when, when I say red zone, I mean somebody who's at risk right now, either of hurting themselves or hurting somebody else or making like a truly irrevocable mistake. That's for you to define. Um, if they're at risk, you should be calling 911. Um, that's, that's where it is. Um, in general, one of the signs of uh, crisis is that you feel like the responsibility is all on you. The world kind of shrinks around you and you're carrying the whole thing. Um, and you feel like you can't reach out to people and it's just up to you to care for this one person, in this case, your child. And as soon as you feel this, the advice I got a long time ago, and I think it's good advice, is you immediately push out against it and you immediately start involving other people. Call your sister, see what she thinks. Call another parent, see what they think. Call the school counselor, see what they think. Just start talking to people. Um, so that's at the very light shades of red. Um, but if you think that there is really like an actual safety risk, then you call 911. Um, okay. And also, we just posted a link to the green folder, which is a resource from Sequoia Healthcare District. So that has a lot of things that you can do today, resources you can call today, places yeah. where you can get help, other than, of course, checking in with your child's pediatrician. So do check that in the chat, but as Iran said, if it's really emergency, 911 is what you should call. Yeah, and if, um, you're, again, if you're not sure if it's an emergency or not, that already means you should be talking to somebody about this, right? Like if, if you're sitting there saying like, I don't know if this is quite 911, at the very least, call two people right away that you trust and talk to them about it, right? Just don't leave it stuck in your head. Crisis wants to do that. And that's one of the, the ways to identify it is that you're starting to think like you need to figure it all out. You don't, you never do. There's a huge system around you. Lots of people you can consult with, friends, family, and also in the school system, people you can talk with. And uh, okay, and, and tonight, tomorrow night also, we are literally going to do a parent education event called Mental Health 101, When Should Parents Seek Help? And it's gonna have a lot of resources for parents, including from Dr. Joshi, who's really the leader in mental health school education at Stanford, okay? So we care, email us, ask questions, we're here. All right, Iran, great questions here, let's get started. This is the first one. When you are enjoying your child doing something together that they love and your st child starts ask, acting disrespectfully, and are breaking rules, should I ignore? How can I enjoy instead of coach when they're doing the wrong thing? Well, I mean, if you're not enjoying it, you're not enjoying it. Uh, and if they're doing things that are annoying you, then, then probably it's not gonna be enjoyable for you. I think I would start from just kind of a simpler 
place, right? Some people, some parents really are just always in coach mode and you can sort of feel it and it's unpleasant for both parties. Um, so I'm just suggesting that even just when times are fine, basically to, to switch off the coaching, to switch off the teaching. I think that if your child is doing something that you, you dislike, you really would like them to do differently. Again, it's a question of how intense it is. Um, if it's a small thing, it may be worth sliding, right? And saying, oh, this is my you know, hour of not being preachy, teachy parent. If it's a big thing that you really care about, then of course you, you fix it, that's, that's okay. Um, I think, again, you orient toward how do I do this in a way that's most respectful, most clear, um, not confrontational, a way that doesn't cost me a lot of relationship points. Um, so one thing that's related to that is this idea that ideally you don't, I would recommend not showing negative emotions to your children, right? Not showing that what they're doing is pulling your strings and making you upset. Um, I think that's unhelpful in a few different ways. Like, um, for example, first of all, again, kids, kids seek power and influence, uh, just like most people, uh, but they're missing it especially. And so to be able to influence your emotions is a big deal. And that's something that can actually be quite motivating for some children to realize that they can upset you and something they'll reach for when they're feeling yeah. powerless enough. That's yeah. one reason. Um, the other is that it can actually be very scary for a child to see their parent upset. Uh, and so that'll make them further upset. So that's not helpful either. Instead, you know, when they're doing something that you're unhappy with, you, you correct it, you know, as neutrally as you can, as respectfully as you can, you know, we don't do this, you know, I asked you not to do this before, if you're going to do this, you know, I'm not going to be spending time right now together, we're not going to, whatever it is, but fairly neutral um, as a way to, to correct. But I strayed a little bit from the original question. Um, I think that, yeah, my summary for this would be, if they're doing something that you feel like you need to correct, then correct it. But ask yourself first, does this have to be corrected right now? Um, otherwise, uh, again, see if you can spend some time with your, your coaching switch uh, switched off. Okay, thank you, Ron. Here's a related question. I know a lot of parents can relate to. Um, whoops, I just, hang on. What about asking the child to participate in routine things like piano lessons? That seems like a withdrawal and it can irritate the child. Yeah, so good insight with this question. I think some parents have a hard time with something exactly like piano lessons because they say, well, it's clearly for their benefit. So how is this not a deposit? But if, but if it's annoying to your child, then, then it's not. Um, and so first of all, good for you for recognizing that. Um, in terms of how to do that, there's a separate, let me think for a second how to structure this. In my mind, this question belongs in the domain of how do you get your child to build helpful, good, healthy habits, right? One of these habits might be practicing piano every other day or every day and so on. Um, there's, you know, you can go to the website, parentingforhumans.com. You'll see the, the other talk that I did that was recorded, I think with Charlene uh, about this. Um, and, and it talks about things like that in more detail. But the, the short version is that you, you do ideally start with something that doesn't feel like a great withdrawal, that feels pretty easy um, for your child and that doesn't create resistance. So if your child right now is practicing, if you would like your child to practice piano for an hour a day and your child right now is practicing piano for two minutes once a week, then asking your child or telling your child to practice piano an hour a day every day is going to just be a clutch. There, just nothing good is going to come out of it, right? Instead, what you want is to get your child used to feeling successful and having no resistance in doing the first step. Because the, the hardest part is the first step. So in this case, just sitting down at the piano bench. Right. Literally that, if you can get your child to sit down and play for a minute a day, a minute a day, or a minute every other day, whatever it is, right? But just stop associating the piano bench with like this feeling of dread and conflict, right? And have them feel very successful when this happens. 
um, from there, you can start building. They'll sit for a minute. You'll be like, that was amazing. You know, you kept the, your end of the bargain and I'll do whatever it is you agreed to do. That's how you do things. Um, but from there, you can start pushing them, right? Two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. Um, but I think that a full frontal collision, trying to get your child to do something that is very far from what they're doing now, that's basically guaranteed to result in a, a lot of friction. And so you go for an easy goal, very much within reach, and then build from there. Help, help both of you feel successful. So Ron, and on a related note again, this question, like if we could answer that, you would win every parenting award. Um, <laughs> can you give an example of how to respectfully ask your child to clean their room? Yes. So, uh, well, I don't know that I'm going to win every possible award, <laughs> award but I'll, I'll tell you an opinion about that. Um, I think, so there are a few different tacks to take. One is keeping with what I was just saying before about building good habits, right? Ideally, you help your child develop a habit of keeping the room clean, which is every parent's fantasy, right? Um, and I recognize that that's starting from fantasy, but but you start with, again, something. So maybe the habit is about, you know, putting one piece of laundry into the laundry hamper at the end of the day. Uh, maybe it's pick, pick a thing and get your child to do that and you provide enormous amounts of praise uh, and, and recognition when your child can do that one simple thing and then start gradually building up from there, right? But habits are about when something happens, I do this thing without thinking about it, right? So have some sort of a clear link. Is it that, you know, when they come home, instead of like throwing the backpack, you know, somewhere in the living room, like they put it next to the entrance door. That's a good first step. If, you know, they, they finish showering, then the first thing they do after showering is take their clothes and put them in the laundry hamper instead of, you know, on their sister or whatever. So you can start working on it from a habit perspective and ask, make just a minimum request. So minimum withdrawal, they do something very small and then you start building from there. And every time the request is just a very little bit more than what they were doing before. So minimal withdrawals, so that's one thing. Another thing in terms of, so a totally different tack on how to clean the room. You can imagine what a disrespectful, uncaring version of that would be, right? Your kid is doing something that your kid cares about in his room and you open the door and you shout at your kid, clean your room, I told you a thousand times, why won't you blah, blah, blah that's not respectful. It doesn't come across as especially caring. Uh, nothing good is going to come out of it, right? You're essentially trying to intimidate your child into doing this. You're not winning relationship points. You're probably losing some, right? So better ways to do it could be something like knock, knock, knock. And they go, yeah. And you say, can I come in? And they say, not now. And you say, when's a good time? And they say, I don't know, 10 minutes. You're like, okay. And you come back after 10 minutes and you go knock, knock. And you're like, yeah say, can I come in? It's been 10 minutes. They're like, oh, I don't know. And then you can push a little. You can say, well, you know, you said 10 minutes and I want to talk to you about something. You say, okay, fine. Open the door and you kind of look around. You say, um, I'd really appreciate it if you could clean your room. You know, we have the National Room Cleanliness Committee inspection happening and whatever reason you want them to clean their room. Uh, and, but, but you're just kind of polite and clear about it, right? So that's a respectful way of doing it. Um, and then the third, which is related to the second, the third kind of perspective about this is really explaining the reason why you want the room clean and ideally consulting with your child about this. So you might say, look, here's a list of chores, things that need to happen around the house. I realize it's a lot. I know I've been clashing around it. I've been thinking about it a lot. And the thing that for me feels most important is to make sure that your room is tidy. Um, and I say this because I know that sometimes in the mornings you get very stressed about not being able to find a thing that you need, you know, and, and we've been through this. You just, you get so upset, you can't find a thing and you're in a hurry and so on. And I think that could be really helpful and just remove this thing. And, and I think it would be better for you. I know it would be better for me. Would you be willing to figure out together some system to help you keep the room clean or tidy or whatever? Right? And then there's a conversation around it. These kinds of conversations are enormous relationship points, right? You're consulting, you're sharing power, you're deciding together. You ask them what's a good way for them to do it 
the, the whole mindset changes. This is no longer war. This is now, at, at worst case scenario, this is compromise. Right. Best case scenario, this is collaboration. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank you, the audience, for really amazingly good questions coming in. And we're gonna try to get to as many of them as we can, because they're all valuable and they're all good. So Ron, we're gonna see how many we can get to. Um, here's a question from a parent, which I think is valuable and something that many people feel, and it's difficult. What do you do with the regret you may have about so many parenting mistakes in which I've hurt the relationship with my kids? Um, we all have them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, what do you do? I would say you learn from them and move forward. Uh, I would say specifically, you don't beat yourself over the head with them. Uh, okay, but let me be a little more, more concrete. We, so I'm, I'm very glad essentially every time, so far it's been pretty consistent in my life that I look at myself two years ago and I say, what an idiot, right? To me, that's, that's a good moment because it feels like I'm still learning and growing, right? That, 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 the year when I look two years back and I say, yeah, that made total sense that I did that, I, I'll get worried when this happens because it means I stopped learning how to do things better. So maybe that's a different frame for, for mistakes. Um, but I think that if you feel like there was an injury that happened and it's kind of ongoing, you did something that is still upsetting for your child or that you clash over it, I think it may be worth really talking about, right? And doing like, a good apology um, and apologies have, you know, a few steps in them. Like you talk about, you mention the thing, you say the behavior, you acknowledge the impact on the other person. You specifically say the negative emotion that you feel about it. I'm really sad that I feel ashamed that I did this thing. Like you kind of you own it and you offer zero explanations or excuses for why you did it. You don't try to defend or justify zero, zero. You just say, you know, I've been thinking about this time when this thing happened and I just took away your blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, I feel horrible about it. You know, I realized that was the wrong thing to do. It was a total power move. Uh, and, and I don't say, but I was really upset or, you know, I was really struck. I don't say any of those things. I just say, I feel really horrible about this. Uh, and I, I want to apologize and uh, I will not do that again, right? So the last step is, you make a very clear, strong commitment to doing something differently next time, whether you don't do it or something. So if it's that level of an injury and, and you feel like you need to talk about it with your child, do talk about it with your child. And there are ways of apologizing, again, that are age appropriate for every age. So that's one thing, how to start fixing it with your child. In terms of with yourself, I think the only, the only path forward is forward. Um, I, I don't think, if, if you're able to not dwell on it, I think it's better not to, and instead to atone by building a better relationship, basically. Um, and, and as much as you can move forward, I realize easier said than done, um, but as far as what's, what's helpful about it, that's, that's, how I would, uh, that's how I would go about it. You know, a lot of parents think that apologizing makes them look weak, but in fact, Bev and I and Iran feel real strongly that that actually builds relationships and trust when parents apologize and really adds to that deposit account that Iran has mentioned. So many good questions here. I hardly know where to go. Okay, Iran, here is another one. Um, can you give some examples of a neutral response when you're upset? Something to say to your kid that's neutral. Yeah. And yeah, and I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. Also something else popped into my mind. I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut myself off for a second here. I, I was talking about the class and if, if people are going or went already, you'll see that the class that looks like it's open for registration now is the one that started three days ago. Um, so people can join it if you want. There was only one session, but uh, otherwise you can register and it will be for the next one. Um, or just send me an email and ask me when the next one starts. I, I just realized that I didn't update the dates there. Now, in terms of, a neutral reaction when somebody does something you don't like. Um, mainly I'm talking about like actual expression of emotion, right? So 
you could say, uh, let's think about a situation. Um, you're driving with your teenage daughter and you ask her questions and she's chewing gum and responding with half words uh, that are hard to understand while typing on her phone, right? So Never had that happen. <laughs> uh, just making it. So you might, uh, you know, you could turn and get upset about this, right? It's very easy to get upset. Be like, Alyssa, I told you, I like, put down your phone, look at this, so disrespectful, I can't believe you're, that kind of stuff. Um, or you could stop talking until she looks at you and she's like, what's up? And you're like, I don't, I don't like talking uh, when you're also on the phone, you know? If, if, you, wanna, if you wanna talk, I'm, I, I'd love to talk, um, but not at the same time as you're on your phone. She's like, what's the big deal? Uh, and you can just say, I, I just prefer not to. Um, and you just, again, try to keep it as clean, as neutral as you can. If your uh, uh, two and a half year old is lifting a large toy and about to throw it uh, in a way that will either break the toy or a friend's head, uh, you grab the toy, you put it under the ground, you kneel down and you tailor your child at eye level. We don't, we don't throw things. It's really dangerous. And also your toy can break. So we're not throwing, but that's it. This is the level of intensity, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to all the other things you can imagine. So this again falls under the giant umbrella category of easier said than done uh, because some things are upsetting. My only, my two suggestions about this are one, if you can learn to identify the signs in yourself that you're about to get upset. Maybe you get warm, maybe you get sweaty, maybe you think about aliens attacking you know, from the sky, whatever it is. Find your signs, and as soon as they're starting to come up, don't ignore them. Don't push past the point of, I'm about to get really upset. When you're about to get really upset, and you realize it, immediately stop the interaction. Say like, you know, actually, this is not a good time. Or say, I have to go to the bathroom. Or say, let's continue this in a bit. Or say, I'm getting really upset, uh, and I don't think we should continue on this uh, right now. Whatever you need to do, right? But stop before you are about to blow up. Um, ideally. Um, and if you can't do that, and if you catch yourself getting upset, again, just stop as soon as you can, kind of disengage. Because when people are upset, nothing good happens in the, in the interaction. Um, so ideally, yeah, learn to see it coming and disengage if you're possible, if you're able to. Um, but these are, so these are a couple of examples of how I would imagine kind of correcting neutrally. But if, if you want to give me specific scenarios, I'm happy to try to improvise around them. Okay. Sort of in this same genre of what do you do when the behavior is offline, here's a parent who asks, how can you create a culture of goodwill and focus on praise, et cetera, when your teen is rarely home and lying, drugs, and disrespect are prevalent? How can you create a culture of goodwill when those other negative things are happening? That's a very tough one. Yeah. So when your child is not present and when your child is present, uh, then basically, you know, uncomfortable or offensive or unhealthy things happen that are, I, I imagine, quite triggering uh, to, to us as parents. Um, how do we create a culture of goodwill? I think there are a few things that one could do um, in no particular order. One is, Generally in relationships, I think it's super important and very helpful to be really explicit about whatever it is you're trying to convey, right? We think other people understand how we feel about them and that we care so much, you know, what, but it, it's amazing what a difference it makes to actually say that, right? And so to be able to say something like, um, you know, uh, I, I really care about your opinion, you know, I really value your opinion or to say, um, you know, I, I want to do the thing that will work the best for you. So I think it's just worth spending a little bit of time talking about this, right? Because I, I really want to make sure that you're happy with the result. Because this is this is for you, really. Um, any, anything like that. Or to say, I really, I want to hear, I care about what you're going through. Or even to say, um, you know, uh, I, I want to give you a piece of advice, right? Uh, because I see what you're going through and it just looks very painful. And I, I care so much about how you feel. Uh, and I know you may or may not take it, uh, but, but I want to say it in case it's helpful. Because um, I really think that, you know, I, I know how much you care about staying in your 
volleyball team. And I, I, I think that this can make a difference uh, for it, right? So you, you're very explicit about why you care and how you care and all of that. So in this situation, I think that if you can find a moment to, to spend with that child or send a text message or write a letter and leave it pinned you know, to the door or under the door or whatever, um, and just be explicit about wanting to build a culture of goodwill and specifically about you initiating it. And you know, one thing is easy about relating with kids, which is you know for a fact that you're the adult and it's your job to be the adult in the relationship. Um, right. Whereas with grownups, it's a little hard to know who's going to be the adult at any given time. It, it is absolutely our job to be the adult in the relationship at any given moment. And that means that it's up to us to break negative cycles. They're yeah. Not yeah. And, you know, our good friend, Ned Johnson, co-author of The Self-Driven Child, is online with us. Yeah. Ron and I know you would agree, Bill and his partner, Bill Stixer and Ned, and you all say it's important to ask permission. It's one of the first things I learned from you, Iran, is to say to your kid, I have an idea, may I share it with you? I have a piece of advice, would you like to hear it? Because here's a question, I think this is, it's related. Um, a parent asks, what happens if I was a strict parent and try to reestablish a good relationship with my teen, but he's resistant? How do I make up deposits in a short amount of time? And I think those things that you just suggested are the way to do it. I want to hear you. I want to listen to you. Yeah, so I think being explicit is definitely helpful. I think, you know, again, if, if you really have very little communication, a short, clear note, you can leave it, you can email it, you can text it, whatever you need. Um, even those things can be asking for too much for a child who's really just disconnected from you or needs a lot of space, right? Because when you're constantly giving people a lot of written material, they're like, the hell, I, I didn't want this. Uh, and so, again, something to be judicious with. But I think finding the micro deposits and doing them consistently can, can make a big difference. And so if you are able to muster, you know, the, um, the positive emotion when your child does walk in through the door uh, and to just smile, right? And just make sure that that interaction is positive, that one interaction, right? Enjoy your child because your child you know, in an extreme version, your child might just be totally closed off to your parenting and coaching. Um, and, and you have to start from having a sense of enjoyment in the relationship. So to be able to smile and say hello and enjoy your child in the moment, that's a start. To be able to ask your child for a preference, right? To say, we're going to be doing X, what would be your, you know, preferred version of that? Or we're thinking about doing X or Y or Z, which would you prefer? Um, so giving them, again, some power, showing that you care about their priorities, what they care about, being very careful not to push their boundaries um, when they're setting them up in a clear way. Um, and uh, back to the beginning, to, to literally tell your child, you know, uh, things have been rough and, you know, I want to see us closer. I want to support you. I know there have been some clashes between us. Uh, it's not how I want things to be. Um, I'm not asking you right now to do anything and I'm not, you know, offering to do anything. I'm, I, I just want to make it clear, you know, my top priority is for us to, to feel good about having one another in our lives, right? Something like that. And then, then drop the mic and then walk away. And that's it. That's the whole message. And that's a start. And parents, I really want you to hear Iran here, that what he's saying is so important you can and should be explicit with your children about your goals for your relationship with them. So if you parents say those words, Iran, but especially for teens, they really need to hear them. I want to have a better relationship with you. I want to be close with you. I care about what you think. Really game changers. Okay, speaking of limits, here's a great question on limit setting. What about limit setting while maintaining connection? Kids test limits and often want to or need parents to hold the limit, even if the kid pushes really hard with negative behavior. How do you do it? How do you keep holding the line? I, I would love to have like specific examples because I think the, you know, what's, what's the scenario? How old is the child and, and what's happening? Because it's going to look with different with different kids. But this comes back to I kind of been, so if the person who wrote this question would like to provide a scenario, that would be wonderful. And I'd love to, to hear it. Okay. Jess, uh, 
you have something to add, please feel free to put it in the Q and A. I'll say kind of in broad strokes. Um, do you remember I was talking before about how kids try to take power if they don't feel like they're they're allowed any? Um, and I think kids test boundaries a lot more when when there's a huge amount of boundaries around them. Um, and if you let them make more choices and have more power, then the few times when you kind of put your foot down, and again, it doesn't have to be angry or scary, um, then they'll, they'll more likely respect it because that's, again, part of having goodwill toward you, which you've built by giving them respect and care and so on. Part of the goodwill translates into their willingness to cooperate with you and listen to what you have to say. And so if, if you generally you know, structure your evenings around what your kid wants to do. And then once in a while you say, oh, tomorrow we have Aunt Nellie visiting, you know, so we can't, you know, that's going to be what we do as a family. You have a much better chance of succeeding if the child generally gets a voice most of the time. Um, otherwise, in terms of like in the moment, your child is running around doing things that your child is not supposed to be doing. Um, and you need to set a boundary. Again, I would just go for minimal negativity. Set, set the boundary you need to. You, you decide, you know what, what the right boundary is, in your opinion. Um, but just minimum negativity. And even to be clear, you, you can say, like, I'm sorry, I know this is not what you want, uh, but this is this is how we have to do it. And this is why, if they're big enough, you can explain why. Um, and, and it's okay to, to empathize and to understand, you know, to be clear that you understand why this is upsetting or disappointing or whatever it is for them. Maybe they need emotion words to process what's happening. You can give them these emotion words. Um, but to empathize and care and be respectful and still hold the line. Um, so I, I, again, I realize this is kind of abstract. I don't know how, how helpful this is, but if you want to talk specific scenarios, I'm happy to. Okay. So here, speaking of emotion words, here's a related question. Really interesting question. How do you get your teen to take you seriously if you're not showing your emotion of disappointment or not talking to them? My 17 year old son knows I'm upset due to things not getting done, but he still wants a hug. I feel like he does it just to see if I'm still upset with him, even though we're on day two of him not clearing the dishes out of his room or doing his laundry. Yeah, yeah, and so the question is, um, when I'm upset with my son, but he still kind of wants me to behave as though I'm not upset, then how how will he know? How will he know that I'm upset, Charlene? What was the start? I'm sorry. Or how do I get him to take me seriously? Yeah, yeah. I think the parent is trying to show restraint and not be too emotional. And the kid still wants that physical affirmation that we're good, but the parent still wants the kid to comply, to do those things that he agreed to do. Yeah, so I, I think that there's there's really a, a paradigm shift here um, regarding this particular question, which is there's an assumption here, and I, I want to say this, you know, very softly. One moment, sorry. And parents, for those of you who need to sign off right at 630, thank you so much for joining us. We have never had so many great questions. Really appreciate it. We're going to yeah, stay on for another few minutes, but I just wanted to release people who had just allowed for this one hour. Iran, please, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And also, um, I don't remember if we put my email in the chat or not, but feel free to contact me. You know, we can talk if you have specific questions. Um, you know, I don't charge people for, for talking. I'm just happy to hear about what you're going through uh, and okay, so it together. Bev, I'm sure that email has probably been in the chat, but if you don't mind adding it. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Bev. Oh, so the email is in the chat. Oh, thank you. So, okay, in terms of the question that was that we were starting on, um, I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of coming from a different paradigm, right? Which is, my child will take me seriously if he knows I'm upset. Um, yeah, the parent yeah. trying to control but yeah, whereas I, I think the, the, the framework that I'm proposing here is my child will take me seriously if my child feels that I care and respect him. Um, because I don't know that being upset is what's going to, to do it. Okay, let me, let me organize my thinking. I think the parent again is trying not to talk to the kid 
and the kid is again wanting the physical affirmation, yeah. but still not complying. Yeah, so to, in a sense, Sorry, I, I want to I want to word this very uh, very carefully. Ideally, we want our children feeling connected to us all the time, uh, feeling safe with us all the time. Now, when we're upset with them, we might not want to hug them, and that's legitimate. We're people too, and we get to have boundaries as well. And if we do hug them, it might not feel good for everybody. So that, you know, but ideally we wanna be able to extend warmth, closeness and connection. If we can or don't want to do it physically then by words, and we can say again, like I'm, I'm, I'm very upset right now, um, but I'll come talk to you, you know, when I calm down, okay? Like that's, that's a legit fair move. Um, but to, to actually disconnect from your child when you're upset can be very scary for your child, very scary. and. And I, I think not the way, we, we don't want to use it as a tool at any point to get our child to, to cooperate with us. Um, so I think that, again, my, my you know, maybe, maybe overly uh, optimistic uh, approach here is that if you make enough deposits, if you build a good enough relationship with your child, and if you're selective about the kind of withdrawals that you make, your child ends up cooperating with you pretty easily a lot of the time, right? So the, the question of to take you seriously um, kind of fades away. So I would say in this case, if you feel like your child is not taking you seriously and the dishes are piling in his room, to be able to go in and say, please clear your dishes, and, and he doesn't. And let's say you get upset, that's okay. Like go get upset elsewhere. And you can come back and say, you know, um, here's, here's what's going to happen, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to clear the dishes uh, and you're, you're not allowed to bring any more dishes into your room or I'm going to take the dishes out, but then, you know, we need to find a system to make sure dishes just never go into your room because so far they're only staying or whatever. But again, have, have a conversation about it. Um, and, and I just want to kind of triple underline it. It's, it's fine for us to be upset. Of course, we, you know, things are upsetting. That's okay. But we don't want the upset to be the driver of relationships or behaviors. Um, and we certainly don't want to use disconnect as a, as a tool to, uh, to get kids to do what we would like them to do. Right. But as Bev reminded me, it's like we say to our young children, I still love you, but I don't love what you're doing. You, know, you can still call out the behavior separately from your love and respect for the child. Yeah, I mean, to you know, if you can if you can pull it off while upset, more power to you. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I'm upset, I'm generally just upset, and then mostly I just try not to, you know, be scary in my upset. Okay, so I know that we're over time, but Iran, could we take two more? Yeah. Okay. Here is a question that's a follow-up to the one on regret. Really good question. How do you get an older child to tell you what they're actually upset about? Despite trying, I don't know what they're upset about. Do you just give a blanket apology? So how do you get that child to talk who's upset, who really won't tell you what's wrong? Okay, and, and the idea is that the child is upset with me, the parent, but we just are not sure what. So the child, so the child is just upset in general. So you as a parent know they are, um, but I can't, as a parent, I can't figure out, I can't get them to tell me what they're upset about. Okay. I was just trying to, because you said at some point an apology, to, I don't know what to apologize for. So it's not like my, I'm suspecting they're upset with me. Uh, you may be right. That was the last part of the question. You just give a blanket apology. Okay. So, okay. well, I'll, I'll answer both, both versions of the question. Why not? So... In general, if you're asking your child to talk with you about something and they don't want to, uh, that means that you, 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 you don't have enough relationship points for them to talk about a thing that's uncomfortable for them for some reason, right? Um, they might just be feeling super awkward about it. Maybe they're worried about feeling judged or about getting advice from you, which they don't like, or 
being called out in some way. We, we don't know what they're thinking, but you know, it, it's basically saying insufficient credit. And it's, it's not a fun message to receive, but life becomes a lot simpler when you start hearing that message uh, and treating it as such. Oh, and you're, you're right. The, the question was upset with the parent. Okay. Child is upset with the parent. So I guess, especially if the child, you know, if the child is upset with the parent, uh, then there is some sort of relationship, uh, you know, hurt that happened. And so it makes it actually more likely that the child will not talk to the parent about things that are difficult, vulnerable, potentially explosive, things like that, right? Because there's not a sense of total safety and ease there. Um, and so there's a slow route and there's a fast route. Uh, and as usual, the slow route probably will work more of the time, but the fast route is so tempting. So why not talk about it for a bit? Um, the, the slow route is you have to rebuild the trust. You have to put in the energy and the time to help your child realize that you are indeed safe, caring, trustworthy, uh, and all of those things. And, and these things are done only through experience. That They have to experience you as all those things. It's not enough to say those things, right? So you just have to demonstrate again and again that you are all of these things. Um, I think the fast route uh, can be combined, I guess, with this, which is, again, to, to have a sit down conversation, or if that's too uncomfortable, write a note, um, especially for an older child, write a teen, like that's a great thing, like write a note, again, apologize if you feel like you need to apologize, like if you think something bad happened. If your kid is just upset and you feel like you did nothing wrong, I don't know that you need to apologize. Uh, you can just say, I noticed that you're upset and I'd like to know what that is about. You know, I care about you extremely uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to know so, so I can understand and, you know, learn uh, and so that we can find a way to get past it. Like really just write a note um, and, or, or say it if you can face to face, but don't force the conversation, right? Because again, that's a very important boundary that your child is setting up. So. You can mention it once in a while to say, I have a sense that this thing is going on and I'm not sure, what do you, what do you think? Is, it, is there something that you'd like to talk about? And if they say no, then the answer is no. We don't, we don't push it because that's part of how we prove that we are actually trustworthy and respectful. Yeah, Bab talks about when her younger daughter was really upset that when there was a closed door, sometimes she'd just slide a note under the door. Yeah. That can be a very effective technique especially when you've got a kid who goes in and shuts the door. Okay, so Iran, this parent asks, um, do you suggest that you calmly name the negative emotions you're experiencing as a parent like, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling frustrated? Is that a good technique or not? Um, so presumably this is in the general context of they did something that's upsetting for us somehow. Uh, and, yeah. Um, we're trying to, to be neutral about it. So I, I think ideally we don't go into a big discussion of how we feel as parents. Uh, we kind of manage the situation and move on. Um, so again, if you have, you know, when I had a two and a half year old that was about to throw a big toy towards somebody else, I wasn't saying, you know, I feel disgusted with this behavior. Or I wasn't saying, you know, I feel uh, you know, angry or scared or whatever. I just said, you know, we don't do this. The toy could break. The other kid might get hurt. This is not something we do. So that's like at a two-year-old level. Um, for a kid that's older, you know, who's not cleaning his room and has dishes piling up in the room next to the laptop, um, I also don't think that it's especially helpful to come in and say, again, something like, I feel so disrespected. Uh, this, you know, I feel, you know, extremely upset. It gives me a lot of anxiety when things like, or to say, you know, I'm so angry that you don't, blah, blah, blah. I would rather talk about the situation, the behavior you want to see, um, kind of solutions that you can think of together or lines that you're going to draw in the sand but not turn it into a discussion about, again, how you feel and- so that puts the focus back, puts the spotlight back on you, the parent. Yeah, I think that it kind of becomes about me. It's, you know, worst case scenario, it becomes about the child managing my emotions, which is not their job and shouldn't be their focus. Um, I think it's good enough for them to, 
again, this is when it has to do with them. I think that if a child is older and you're talking about things that happened at work and you're actually sharing life with them and you might say when, you know, so when, when Jane did this, uh, I got very angry because it felt like she totally wasn't, well, like, fine, you teach them how you feel, right? And how people feel things, that's fine. But I think that, again, if, if anything, you're just giving them like more specific buttons to start pushing. Uh, it's, it's just not, not helpful. Um, I don't think it's worth going into. Again, you're, you're the adult in the relationship uh, with, with your child. Um, their job is not to, to worry about you, I think, and how you feel. Yeah, yeah. I think we need to just have regular Ask Iran hours. Okay, Iran, last question. This one for all the marbles, okay? Uh, this is a question that every parent has every day. The don't nag part is really hard. How do we get kids to do their chores in a timely manner? Taking away privileges doesn't seem to help as a consequence. So what else can we try? How do you get kids to do what in a timely manner? I'm sorry. Chores. Chores. Or piano practice or whatever. It's the nagging part that parents so easily all of us fall into. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you honestly, like when I when I say relationships first, I'm not. It's, it's really literal. Like I will let a lot of things slide in order to not hurt the relationship. And I realize that's an approach that not everybody may be comfortable with, but I'm fine being, you know, a few minutes late someplace. Uh-oh, we're hearing Spanish, can you all guess me you're off? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think relationships first, right? You really find out what is worth sacrificing relationship points for. And if you find yourself constantly nagging, it means you have too many open fronts uh, that you set up without having enough you know, support around those open fronts. I so mean, Bruce Bader like, Ginsburg said the secret to a long marriage is not listening to everything. Sometimes being deaf. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's what she said, yeah. So I think it's you know, if you're trying to get your kid to clear the dishes, if you have to nag your kid to clear the dishes and practice piano and walk the dog and clean the room and wash behind the ears and you have too many things going on, pick one, drop everything, get, go for easy wins. So you start feeling better, like things are improving. So your child starts feeling better, like it's not constant nagging and he's not constantly failing, right? Get a foothold, get a toehold, foothold you know, full body hold, whatever. I don't know how the terms continue from there. You know, if you feel like the most important thing is piano, do that. If it's, sorry, not the most important. If you like the easiest win is piano, do that. If the easiest win is clearing dishes, do that. But drop, drop everything that's creating conflict, except for the thing that has the least conflict around it, build it, succeed with it, then go to the next thing that has the least conflict and you're already on a momentum of success. If you're constantly walking around, nagging your kid to do things, it's again, you're, you're, you're living in a state of, of overdraft, relationally speaking. And so don't ask for less. If you got to that point, ask for less, ask for things that are likely to be, that your kid will likely cooperate with and then build from there instead of trying to do the everything all the time. Okay, any final, final words, Iran? Thank you for all your generosity today and all the great question answering and advice. Final words. No, really my pleasure. I, 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 I would say maybe the obvious thing is that what I'm telling you here is opinion, right? I mean, if some of this works for you, great. If some of this doesn't, that's fine. Certainly I'm not offended. Uh, I might never know, but I, I hope you'll experiment with some of this. It's the same thing that I suggest parents do with their kids, right? Offer experiments, agree to do something differently for one or two weeks and just see if it feels better. And if it doesn't, then try something else. And so again, I don't want to come off as though like I know everything and I know, you know, I have all the answers or anything like that at all. I have kind of my way of thinking about things and orienting to relationships. Uh, and if, if you find it helpful, that's that's wonderful. And if you don't, that's okay. Um, and you know, again, if you want to be in touch or talk or have questions or feedback or anything, really email me. I'd, I'd love to talk to literally with, with you specifically and hear you know, what's going on and, and think through it together. Well, thank you, Ron. I've been in education all my life. I have young adult kids. I've known Iran, what, five or six years now at least, maybe more? Yeah, six years, yeah. 
And I do use his advice, including with my adult children. It really works, really makes a difference. So I advise you to share this video, let people listen to it, your spouse, even your kids. So again, thank you, thank you, Iran. We're gonna ask those of you who are with us tonight to log off, but thank you for joining us, for sticking with us throughout this whole time. And we really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Iran. Again, you panelists, if you would come back on briefly, and those of you online, we'd like you to log off if you could. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the Redwood, School, Redwood City School District. Andrea Guerin, thank you all for being here with us tonight. Good night, stay safe, stay well.